I'm Emlyn, as if you didn't know me already. Um, this is me. So my background academically is in pharmacology. Uh, my bachelor's was pharmacology and genomics, and I did my PhD in pharmacology, um, of which I've mostly been involved in uh, preclinical and clinical validation of drugs. So that involves um, cells, animals, and humans. Um, and I've worked with them all. Um, and the talk that I'm giving today is about analysing the electrocardiogram. So back a few years ago, I worked for a biotech called Verona Pharma PLC. And as part of their normal uh, clinical validation, or any normal clinical, clinical validation, you have to do cardiotoxicological studies to check that uh, the, the effect of the drug doesn't cause adverse effects on the autonomic nervous system, of which we use the, the ECG as kind of a reference point for that. Um, the ECG is a, is a famous waveform. If you ever see a medical company and they're using it on their logo, they probably use the ECG. Um, it's a really nice signal. If you're looking to dip your toes in this and haven't done anything uh, with physiological data before, the ECG offers a lot for you. So we refer to the bits of the ECG with these markers, um, PQRST, right? And the reason it's named like that is because it's, it's just calculus, right? They've started at P and they've gone along and said, peak here, peak there, peak there, peak this. Um, what it relates to physiologically is um, well, three, four events uh, inside the heart. So that little P wave are the two little chambers of your heart, your atria's contracting and pushing the blood from the smaller part into your ventricles. The big one in the middle is your ventricles. They're the larger, two large chambers of your heart which eject the heart around your body uh, and create the circulation system. And the T wave, which is all important, is a repolarization step that occurs. So the electrical uh, signal, the action potential that is generated in your heart, is created by the simultaneous opening of ion channels uh, there. And in order to reset them so the next beat can occur, it needs to go through a repolarization, which is basically where it, it drags the, um, the voltage of the membranes of the cells below a certain threshold and thus resets the channels. Um, and of course, if you don't reset the channels, this is actually one of the main mechanisms by which ventricular arrhythmias um, propagate. A normal ECG looks a bit like this. You have a number of ECG waveforms um, that are constant in a row. Your heartbeat, of course, is the distance between those two large R peaks. Um, at that point, when the main ventricles beat, is also the same point where your blood pressure goes to its systolic peak. So that's the uh, largest bit. Um, and so as a result, it's, if you're using a, a PPG sensor inside your smartwatch, something of that nature, this is the thing it measures. It measures that tall peak in the middle. And what makes it quite useful from a signal processing point of view is that's the thing you look for first. And then from around there, you know where an ECG beat is, and then you can find the beginning and the end of it. And in fact, the trickier part is often finding where the beginning of the peak starts and where they end, rather than finding the main points, which I'll come on to a bit later. I recorded my ECG at home. Uh, so back in 2009, I found that a company that distributes medical and biomedical equipment, so I have the stuff at home, which is fun. Um, probably the reason why I started it. And so the way you record it ordinarily is you have a small box, box which has an amplifier, an analog digital converter. You put the electrodes over your heart um, and you get the characteristic waveform. Um, now I should probably point out that if you were doing this uh, in, you know, uh, in a classic sense, this is how the first ECG was recorded. Um, this is Wilhelm Eindhoven and uh, he is famous uh, because, well, he basically discovered the ECG. Um, and You'll also find there are certain uh, parts within uh, cardiology which refer to this guy. So Eindhoven's triangle is named after this guy. And of course, instead of having electrodes stuck over his heart, he's put his hands into buckets of salty water, which act as his electrodes, and then his foot, which is for his ground. Um, and then all the signals get processed and thrown onto a carbon drum. So it is, um, it's old school. So if you, if you want to find yourself a nice steampunk project for the weekend, you can do it like Eindhoven did. The placement of electrodes uh, gives you the characteristic shape, and the ones that I record today are at V2. Uh, lead 2 tends to give you the characteristic shape, um, and it's referred to, uh, if you were Googling for it, as a three-lead ECG, uh, as opposed to a 12-lead ECG, um, where you put 12 leads all around the heart, and you use that as a way of getting different planes of the electrical signal at the time that it beats, and that can give you better um, capacity to make certain uh, clinical diagnoses. So the libraries I'm going to use, today it's really going to be a showcase about the core libraries you can use in Python to do this kind of work. Um, in the pharmaceutical and research space, MATLAB is still very, very popular. Um, and I'm here to basically say it's, that you don't really need to um, because you have everything you need out of the box, um, of which I point out a few of the things which are replacements for things you might use inside of MATLAB, uh, which you can use here, which I think work very well. In fact, peak utils, which I use for some of the uh, peak uh, finding uh, bits, 
is almost directly copied from the signal processing toolbox inside of MATLAB. Uh, so that works out quite well. Um, grand. So I'm a big fan of loading my data out of HDF5. Uh, if you are going to choose a binary format to store your physiological data in, I can't recommend it enough. It has a bunch of decent uh, compression trunking algorithms, as well as having some decent interfaces for reading the files directly into a NumPy array. One of the reasons why NumPy arrays are so fast is it adopts a contiguous block of memory. And especially when you're doing ECG analysis, a lot of it is doing slices and views over your raw data set. So of course, if you have something that's in a contiguous block of memory and you just move the pointer around, it works a lot faster. Um, so this sets you up uh, just fine. Uh, this is all live code. So here we go. So there we go, loaded. And then I've ran this before. There we go. So here's my uh, ECG that I recorded at home. Um, if you use the matplotlib notebook uh, magic method, you can also get all the tools that you used to get on the desktop inside the browser. So there we go, you can see this classic ECG peak. And really what I'm trying to show you at this point is that, of course, when you record it in real life, it doesn't look anything like the diagram you saw earlier. And that's where we're going on to next, filtering and preparing the signal to actually do some analysis on it. So. The reason we have to process it is there are lots of other electrical noises uh, which are going to be um, recorded at the same time as your ECG. Your ECG is a signal from about one millivolt uh, down to about half a millivolt, um, of which your muscles are generating millivolts around you. Uh, you'll be picking up all sorts of information um, from uh, inducted noise. You get a baseline shift because of respiration. Uh, so whenever you breathe, uh, your chest inflates, it compresses your heart slightly, uh, that affects some of the vasculature around your heart, which then has an effect on the ECG, which is what's quite fun, is that you can record uh, respiratory measures from your ECG, um, which people have used before, which is quite nice. So if you're using a chest belt to do res respiration, just take an ECG, that'll give you both. Um, yeah, so the next thing we go on to is detrending and filtering the signal. So the first thing I've done here is detrending and filtering with a Butterworth filter. And the reason I do this is this is basically the kind of the mainstay way of doing it medically, even though it's not the best way of doing it. So to point this out, what we're doing is that we are applying a bandpass filter over our signal because we're not going to, we don't need all the frequencies uh, that we've recorded. Um, for an ECG, you maybe want to go from zero to about 100 hertz. That covers pretty much everything you'd want to see. Um, after you've filtered your signal, it is likely that you might want to see it smoothed because um, if you're going to be looking as we are today at where the peaks occur, then by smoothing the signal, it gives a much sharper um, definition of where the peak is. Um, again, this is basically the kind of way that you would do it um, medically. It's not the best way, and I'm going to go on to talk more about that. But effectively, what we've got here is we've got the signal. The one at the top is my raw signal. The one in the middle is one after I applied my filtering. And you can see it's taken out some of the high frequency components we don't need. And then the smoothing uh, gets a little bit closer to that. Um, now, of course, in the situation where you can't really now see all the different peaks and parts, part of this is an issue with recording the ECG in the first place. You'd like to think your heart is sitting there nice and static, but actually it's a small amount of room for it to rotate slightly. So one of the issues that can occur is you've got one electrode if you're doing a 3D ECG, and it's moved slightly out of orientation to pick up one of the peaks you might be looking at. So if you're looking at, for instance, wanting to measure the width of the QRS complex, fairly important if you're looking at myocardial infarction, things of that nature, um, then you're going to want to make sure you have multiple leads, which is why clinically there are multiple leads. It's so we can get, uh, th so this event of the, of the heart rotating slightly doesn't cause us so much of an issue. Wavelets is basically what I'm coming on to now. So Butterworth filters is where um, you'll have stuff if you have a medical device, but primary research has basically already found that wavelets are, are fantastic for both filtering and detrending the signal, but also for doing identifying peaks within that signal. Um, how many people here are familiar with wavelets and wavelet transformations? Cool, good. Then I was pleased that I chose to then explain what wavelets were. So um, you can take, here what I've done is I've taken a single slice of the ECG. So I've taken, I've already found out where an ECG beat was, sliced that value, and then the next thing that I've done is a wavelet decomposition. So if I do that, mm -mm. Mm -mm. good. 
Yeah, you can kind of see it. So um, this uses the Pi Wavelet uh, package. So if you're using the Wavelet uh, toolbox inside of MATLAB, this actually gives you most of what you need. Um, so a bit like a Fourier transform, which you might be familiar with, where you're taking a complex sinusoid and, and translating it and transforming it into the base components of that sinusoid, Wavelets take a waveform and decompose it into wavelets, smaller parts which describe the waveform. And it does that by convolving uh, one type of wavelet through your signal and then giving you a signal out the other end. Um, the reasons why these work particularly well in this situation is that wavelets are discontinuous. They can, you can be used for um, approximating sharp edges much better. Um, whereas FFT works really well if your signals are smooth or if the ultimate underlying thing is a smooth, continuous, periodic waveform, which in the case of an ECG, it's sort of periodic, but the actual opening of channels in your heart is a probabilistic function. So you get quite a bit of noise and non-deterministic parts which are thrown into this. And I think this is partly why wavelets work so well, is because they match that situation much better. So what we've got here is I've run a uh, Debauchy's uh, wavelet. You don't really need to understand what the choice of wavelet I've got here, simply that that's a good one. You could do an entire talk about choosing the best wavelet for your given signal. Um, and what it's done here is every, it's gone through convolving the wavelet once, twice, third, a number of times, a number of times that I've set in the number of levels that I want to run the wavelet through. And from this, I can get a small signal that either I can run my peak detection on or I can use that to find a particular feature that I could then run through um, my signal to discover something that I want. I also think that's one of the things that works out quite nicely with wavelets. Designing them yourself is often the case of drawing the shape you want, and it will help you find the shape that you need inside the signal. And then to sort of complete the, uh, the package is that you would ordinarily break your signal apart into wavelets, convolve it through, and then what you then choose to do is, so in this case, right, if I take all the wavelets that I had, and I combine them back together, I get my original signal. But if I take only a few of the wavelets, then I can get, for instance, here is a lossy filtered signal, which looks a lot more like the ECG that I wanted, right? This is how, um, if you apply this to a 2D shape, this is how they achieve uh, JPEG 2000, um, is you run um, your wavelets through your image, you find the ones that are either a small or part component, um, and you can remove them from your signal. So this can also be used to compress ECGs, and this is what is done uh, ordinarily to get an ECG to fit into a much smaller space. Um, and of course, as you increase the number of wavelets, right, two, three, four, and then of course we did five levels, we get our original signal. So that's the trick with wavelets, is you can find different components within it. Um, and of course, in the case which makes plenty of sense for an ECG, the reason why like the first wavelet obviously has a really sharp definition of our QRS complex is because it's a very large part of that signal. So this is another nice feature is that usually, I mean, granted there's a lot of theory about choosing the right wavelet, decompose your signal, usually the first wavelet's going to give you the major component of what's going on. And similarly, if you ignore the first wavelet and you go with the rest to the end, then it will complain. We'll ignore that. I actually didn't try that before the presentation, so there we are. We've got a signal, we've pre-processed it. Now we're going to go and do something useful with it. So let's classify some features from the ECG and make some inferences. So I'm not going to use my ECG. I thought originally oh, I'll take loads of ECG recordings to show you those, but actually it is more useful to you guys to point out PhysioNet. So if you want to work on physiological data sets, PhysioNet is the first place to go. It's a huge, great repository of signals, but crucially they are annotated um, by hand and clinically validated. So things like the peaks of the ECG are all in there for you. So if you wanted to try, for instance, to run some sort of routine to classify peaks in the ECG and check how well it was, so you could build a cost function, then this gives you a really decent supervised um, uh, training set to go from. The way that you connect to it is you can use rsync, and I now know why this doesn't work, because I'm using the rsync protocol. But ordinarily, you can do rsync at the physionet.org, and it will then give you a manifest of all the physiological signals that are available. And of course, the reason it's not working, it's using a port that's blocked. So we'll ignore that and uh, come back to it later. Um, the one that I pulled out of there was the QT database. Um, ironically, I didn't go on to uh, do analysis on QT in this presentation, because I felt this was too much of a divergence. But the QT is an important measure for cardiac repolarization. It's a main um, stay of looking at whether drug-related effects are going to cause um, serious ventricular arrhythmia. 
The way that you get these signals in is that uh, the RFDB package, which someone has used to wrap all the tools that come with PhysioNet, um, gives you uh, the ability to read the data out and also some sort of simple uh, plotting uh, libraries. So it allows you to something. Oh, I'm off to the side. Um, yeah, of which you get both the signal record, which you can print out, and there is also a very useful dictionary, although I don't think I've run this, so that won't work. There we go. So you get all of the metadata along with the physiological signal as well, which is particularly important for being able to do inference on it, be able to classify it, categorize it beforehand. Um, like I say, that's part of the reason why I wanted to put a big shout out to PhysioNet. If you want to get hold of data of physiological signals, it has more than just the ECG, it has as many data sets as they've got, and some of them are very large indeed, which can get you to sort of the end numbers that you need to perform sophisticated analysis. Now, finding peaks in the data um, is usually the, the simplest way of doing it is to run a window through your um, signal and then do logistic regressions uh, on the window that you've got. Um, and this is all made a lot uh, useful for you by using the peak utils library. So peak utils, as I sort of showed earlier, has a very useful function called index. You give it a, a signal that you have and you can specify some useful parameters, in which case, I think it's only those two, threshold and minimum distance, so the distance between each peak you expect to find, and what threshold is a normalized um, minus one to one, um, no, zero to one um, of the signal. Um, you can then use that to, to, to find the peaks within the signal. So in this case, this finds all of our R peaks very, very simply. The R peak is very, very large compared to everything else. So ordinarily, when you're doing your pre-processing, it's anything you can to make the peak that you want to see nice and large. And then you can run a very simple peak um, finding algorithm over it. Um, peak, peak utils uh, is using all of the NumPy gubbins, so it runs really, really fast. Um, doesn't run as fast as some of the stuff you can find in MATLAB. It runs fast enough for all the stuff that I've done, to be perfectly honest. And if you're doing it on very large data sets, you can, you, can, you can chop a signal into multiple parts, and it's an embarrassingly parallel problem to do. You cut your signal into multiple bits, throw them over nodes. It's very easy to speed this up, and the algorithm is simple enough to do that. So here we found all of our peaks, which is very nice. Um, and yes, as I'd sort of preempted myself, smoothing the signal beforehand can also help find those peaks if it wasn't going to work particularly well. Um, one of the smoothing uh, functions, if you're not too familiar with them, um, cubic splines are generally quite nice on physiological data, so I tend to use them for quick prototyping. The one problem with any sort of um, aggregate window which goes over the signal is that it's going to cause a little bit of translocation of the signal, so you lose the absolute time point where it occurred. So what I recommend is when you do smooth, is you, you run your peak detecting algorithm over your smooth signal, but then project that back over your raw signal to see exactly where it's occurred. So in the same way, we can run that and we get the same thing. Now granted, I should have chosen a better data set that was noisier, where one of them didn't occur, and then the other one that did occur, but that's effectively how you improve, that's a, a, the chief way of improving your peak detection algorithms is by appropriate smoothing. Now, there is a function inside of uh, the signal package, inside of SciP, which does a lot of this for you. It's called find peaks CWT, of which the CWT bit refers to convolutional wavelet, sorry, continuous <laughs> wavelet transform. It does convolution in a continuous way. So the reason why I recommend peak utils is it has some uh, easier to understand parameters in terms of thresholds and distance and the rest of it, which CWT doesn't do. Um, Wavelet transforms are all about trying to find a particular ridge and edge which matches against the wavelet that you've got. So you've then got to do further details to um, piece out, okay, I've got lots of peaks, now I want to separate out um, all the ones that I have. So of course, in our signal that we have here, where I run this, um, the CWT algorithm, because I, haven't, I can't specify the threshold and the rest of it, has found all sort of the important peaks within my data. Um, one thing it doesn't show you, I realize, because it's not in the default parameters, it's using the Ricker wavelet in order to smooth that. Um, Ricker seems to work well for lots of different problems. And this is a fun thing about wavelets, is the same wavelet that works in decom like compressing images is the same wavelet that works quite nicely in an ECG signal. Um, and in this case, you can run this one, uh, one function from SciPy, and it gives you a pretty good detection of all the major peaks that you'd want to know inside of the ECG. Um, beyond that, you could do further refinement, being able to find those. But for the moment, 
that's a very solid way of finding all the peaks in, in this particular signal. Um, the other thing that you'd want to do, of course, is that as a strategy, find the R peak first, and then look backwards and look forwards. So in this case, what I've done is I've marked in blue and marked in red where I expect to find a P peak and where I expect to find a T peak. So of course, just looking over that data, that fits fairly nicely. And then of course, I've left it as an exercise for the reader that you can then run uh, peak utils either as part of that or use a, de use a discrete wavelet transform over that to smooth that signal and do the rest of it. The one thing that's interesting about wavelets is that often different wavelets work better in different situations. So the QRS complex is a very sharp peak. One wavelet's going to work well for that. A different wavelet's going to work well for the P peak and the T peak. And to get the very, very high accuracies that we can get in primary research, it's, it uses this kind of iterative strategy in order to be able to find each peak and classify them. Okay, so we've got our features. We've classified them on there. We've got all our peaks. A healthy state is kind of the hard thing to define. Um, even large working groups um, don't come up with normative values that you can really make use of. It's usually expected in a, in a pharmaceutical trial, in um, just in healthcare in general, that if you want to do a experiment, you, need a, you either get a control group, or you, if you can, if it's, an, if, it's a, if it's an experiment where giving the treatment doesn't cause an effect later, um, you can use them as their own control group. And there are all sorts of things you have to consider, especially for the ECG. It changes based on your age, um, your size physically, but also the size of your heart. Um, your gender affects it. Uh, so uh, women who are premenopausal tend to have um, a slower heart rate, um, but just by the effect of estrogen uh, on the effect of their endocrine system. Um, and of course, now that uh, women have uh, access to the um, uh, the PMT treatments, starting to lose what that is called, um, that's helped to improve uh, their cardiovascular health with regards to that. And usually when you're measuring the ECG, you're measuring someone at rest, which is when they're sitting. Because when you're standing, that changes things because of how your, your heart has to pump your blood against your now standing body. Um, and you would take that as your normative values generally. That's, that is the opinion of the working task force um, that was set up in the EU. Um, but if you're looking for normative values, you can find them very easily by Googling them. And of course, for a human heart, you're looking at somewhere in the region of 60 to 80 beats, um, of, of which a max of, say, 200 is pretty darn high. And as low as kind of 40, you can see. I remember famously, Ed Merrick, one of, the, um, uh, one of the Tour de France winners, had a resting heart rate, something like 46. So often it can be used as a, an indicator of cardiovascular fitness. In his case, he just had a very large heart, which perhaps also predisposed him to be a very good cyclist because he had, therefore, lots of capacity in his cardiovascular system. Um, so one of the things that we're going to calculate is the heart rate variability. Uh, it is something which is very easy and tractable to calculate, but has lots of things we can infer from it. So this paper in circulation is actually the reference to the working group. Um, I probably should have put the citation in there. I have. Good. I will publish this afterwards so you can see all this. Um, but even this 1996 circulation, that's not that old for cardiology papers, which are looking at normative values. So this is still, I would argue, the de facto reference for it. To calculate heart rate, we've got on our peaks. Um, we've used peak utils to find them. The RR interval, um, you can find by doing the first difference of all the R peaks in your, um, in your signal. So NumPy has this very useful thing called diff, of which if you give it no other parameters, it does a first order diff, second, third, fourth. And then once you've got that, um, you usually express heart rate as beats per minute, so 60 divided by the R intervals. I've already rejected heart rates that I think are out of bounds as a simple measure. Run that all together and plot it, and here we go. This is a fairly typical heart rate signal. Um, yes, some of the peaks have probably been misclassified, but you will have suddenly the situation where suddenly you think, oh gosh, the heart rate's gone up. Perfectly natural. The heart rate, or the heart beating, makes loads of mistakes um, <laughs> as it goes along. But it turns out it's actually not so bad. In fact, there was um, a very large study um, where they were trying class one antiarrhythmics, which are deliberately trying to block um, common arrhythmias, more common in men than in women, uh, for things like premature ventricular contraction. And if you actively uh, apply drug intervention to try and stop the arrhythmias occurring, it actually caused a, ri a rise in mortality. We're not entirely sure why that is, but suffice to say, the human heart is very good at making mistakes and really not causing huge problems. So you expect to see a spiky signal, a bit like this. Um, once you have that, you can then calculate heart rate variability, which of course, embarrassingly, 
it's basically just the standard deviation is kind of the main thing that we use. So the cheapest and trickiest way, to, I did write a stats model thing, I thought that's a bit long. Um, Pandas makes this a lot easier for you. So I just threw the heart rate that I had inside a data frame and do the describe method. And that gives you decent statistics that are running there. Um, a heart rate variability that's kind of normal in terms of, um, according to the circulation paper, uh, it's usually quoted in milliseconds, which is about 170 milliseconds, which as a reference, it's about sort of eight to 10 beats. So the heart rate variability within a sort of a, well, again, this varies as well, within a 30 second, one minute um, uh, window, if your heartbeat varies up and down by sort of 10 beats per minute, that's, that's fine, it really is. Um, now, now that we can calculate heart rate and heart rate variability, what can we say about it? So one of the main things you use this for is for determining of diseases. So you can get your heart rate variability will go down in the event of any one of these particular diseases. So cardiomyopathy, which is where a part of your heart had died, um, occurs because um, you have a, the signal from your brain, which comes down from your vagus nerve, is decreased or the effectiveness of it is decreased. So your heart rate uh, tends to go at the speed that it's automatically done. So if, you're, if you're, you ha your heart is controlled both by neurological signals and it does it automatically, less of your neurological signals are getting in there, it causes your heart rate variability to go down. Diabetic neuropathy, for a similar reason, the nerves that are attached to your heart have become damaged, so then that signal doesn't get through as well. Um, a recent transplant, because your heart has to, you put the heart back in, uh, connect it all up, and then and it's the body that connects the nerves back together in the event of a transplant. The surgeon doesn't sew those back onto the heart because that's impossible at the moment, at least. Um, and then liver cirrhosis is another one that you can see from this. So if you've, um, if you've drunk too much, basically, um, lo way too much, I mean, not just too much, but loads, um, it can eventually lead to encephalopathy. And encephalopathy, again, affects the central nervous system, affects the control of the heart. So all of these things kind of neatly come together. So there's a lot of things you can see just from that one measure. Um, drug interactions as well is another interesting thing that we look at. So of course, uh, beta blockers are acting on the beta adrenergic receptor on your heart. They slow your heart rate down. Um, and antiarrhythmics similarly uh, affect the opening and closing um, of uh, channels on your heart. So as a result, you can see those in the HRV, which again, I've, I've mentioned a couple here, but this is why if you take a heart rate measure, and because the heart rate measure is something you can get from these smartwatches, there's lots of interesting things that could possibly be spotted um, as a result of just that one measure, because anything that would touch the autonomic nervous system could have an effect on the HRV, so it's things that we can infer. And, oh, there we go, turn that from mark down into that, there we go. Um, we also use these as various health indicators. So low heart rate and stable HRV is considered a healthy thing to have. Um, Exercise, so when you exercise, your heart rate goes up. The speed at which it comes back down and recovers is considered a good sign of, um, of high-performing cardiovascular activity. Um, and the thing that I'll be involved in in my new role at Felix is in the indication of stress. So of course, when people get stressed, um, it's uh, emotionally stressed, it can eventually have psychosomatic symptoms of which you get effects on the heart rate which if you look at any of the smartwatches which are out on the market, they will possibly claim they, there are measures of stress that they're getting inside of there. Full of quackery, so we're going to try and attempt to kind of break that apart. Um, but this is kind of the fun thing. It's, it's one measure that we've been able to find, and there's all sorts of things. There's serious cardiovascular disease that we can see. There are effects of drug interactions, but also health indicators, which would be quite useful. So HR and HRV are particularly useful in that way. Now, oh, there we go. No, no, no. No, no, no. There we go. So we are a machine learning conference and I realise I haven't shown you anything <laughs> that involves machine learning. That's most because even though I help organise uh, Pi Data London, um, I actually don't use a lot of machine learning day to day. I just find it very fascinating. So if, you wanna, if you've got something fascinating you want to know more about, build a conference where everyone comes and tells you about it. But the way that it is being used is generally to improve the feature extraction from the ECG. And the way that works is that you will use your uh, convolutional and discrete wavelet transformations to smooth and um, create the signal, but then you use machine learning to match then the wavelet against those particular shapes, um, of which we're getting to accuracies, you know, nine, nine, and a number of nines for getting the, um, the R peak. It's particularly important if you're gonna do this as a medical device, to be able to get to a very, very high degree of certainty. Um, unfortunately, medicine generally abhors uh, probabilities, um, if, it, if it can help it. Uh, so, having more and more certainty is roughly what you need to even get into the door. So um, it's, it's nice to see that these techniques are coming. 
I don't know of any commercial system in the hospital that would use any of this stuff because it's just, it takes so long to get in there. You have to do a clinical trial to prove that your thing is better um, and it costs a lot of money. Um, but what I found more fascinating is that someone applied a uh, long-term, short-term memory model uh, to health records in the US and they were able in a number of cases to predict the disease the patient had from the notes that were taken by the doctors, which is fascinating. I mean, we're not at the point where the machine will do it for us, but if it can at least help with the judgment of diagnosis, um, LSTM in many ways fits the kind of mental model a doctor does to infer what a disease is. He has to take information that occurred recently, information that occurred a while ago, and apply weights as to what one's more important. So I thoroughly recommend this particular um, article. It's open uh, access, which is fantastic. It's up on ArcSiv. Um, and if someone afterwards can come and explain LSTM to me, I did have an exciting LSTM chunk, which I nicked off someone on GitHub, which I thought, oh, I'll make my presentation all around this. I still don't understand what's going on. So <laughs> that's why I need someone to come help me. It uses Keras, that's popular, right? So uh, yeah, if you want to get really at the edge of working in cardiology, the Computing and Cardiology Conference is fantastic. They put on um, uh, challenges every single year. Uh, they've had things like detecting um, uh, sudden cardiac death syndrome, which we now know has a much um, uh, uh, tighter rate, um, uh, correlation to HRV um, and uh, yeah if, if you want to get in with these people it's a lot of MATLAB um, but I imagine over time this will change um, but uh, yeah so that's where I recommend you would go if you're more interested it has the hardest problems they post them up as problems it's a fun place to be um, that's all I've got time for so if you have any questions I'd love to take them Yes, so I thought about whether I would do a big 12 lead ECG and how you put all those bits together, but I figured that I'd fill up an entire talk just with that. Um, so a 3 ECG for the, is kind of for the hobbyist is the first thing to start with, but you're quite right, like you would want to, in the analysis that I have done before, when we were doing this in cardiotoxicology studies, a 12 lead ECG to find also for the key onset and offset points of the QRS, um, but also for the QT interval, getting the really tight, the ends and the beginnings. You also look at, the, you also look at things like the, the shape of the, the peak, uh, its morphology, how it changes over time and things like that. So the 12 ECG helps you uh, control for uh, spatial effects that occur as the heart rotates slightly as it beats, um, and which gets worse as it, as it beats faster and harder. Um, so yes, not included in this talk, but yes, that is certainly something that helps you improve um, your observation of it. I should probably point out as well, my, my friend here is, um, is a medical doctor. He's not just a very well-read data scientist. Uh, <laughs> so if you have questions of that nature, he's a good one to go to. <laughs> sure. So. Um, for the, for the pre-processing that I have done in this presentation, no. One of the funny things as well is LDA, uh, to me, means linear discriminant analysis because it's signal <laughs> processing. And I know it means something like latent something else in, it, you, you do mean linear discriminant analysis. Uh, yeah, it works really nicely because of course, yeah, you look at the particular onset and then you can use that to then find the peak, train that over a series of ECG waveforms, cut them into epochs and use those. Yeah, it works very nicely. Um, 
Yeah, um, I figured that that would be something you could then follow on to, but you'd usually then uh, create a talk that was just focused on the various methods you can use to improve peak detection within a signal. Um, but yes, LDAs work very nicely. Uh, KNNs work more useful with the features you classify afterwards uh, because the uh, ECG has both temporal and frequency effects, so it's nicer to analyze in that domain, whereas KNN generally, you know, spatial effects between uh, various categories. Uh, all of those techniques work well. Um, and often the sad thing is, is that, so I, my background's in pharmacology, and you, you generally don't get taught this. Ordinarily, you have to go find this yourself. So um, eventually this will come through, and you know, the products that um, my friend mentioned um, are coming through basically on this nature as well. So yeah, there's lots of track methods to use here. It's just a time series at the end of the day. I see, for, for the work that I've done, um, that's a really good question. It's depend on which one's more valid. Ironically, it wasn't ever asked of me in a professional setting. It was kind of find the peaks uh, and get the basic statistics and that's enough. One of the things you have to understand in pharmaceuticals, you don't really want to go any further because you might find something which you don't want to know. And if you, <laughs> and if you, and if you, and it's sad, it is really sad, but if you find it out, you're, you are bound by ethics to report it. So often the method is to just not do anything more than you've done, because then I didn't know because I didn't see it. It's often what lawyers will do as well. If you start telling something that's incriminating, they'll go, sorry, I can't hear this, otherwise, you know, I'm going to have to report it. And it's exactly that, unfortunately. Um, but saying that, computing in cardiology is primary research. So they are trying to find exciting new ways of doing it. And particularly because we can find all sorts of things. If anything impinges on the autonomic nervous system, the beating of your heart, the, your breathing rate, you can see it in your heart rate and your HRV. So it's an important measure for all sorts of things, um, of which you need more and more sensitive and continuous information, um, of which the better you can find the features and classify them, then the more sensitive and possibly the more range of things we can infer and find over time. EMG, right, so um, EMG stands for electromyograph or myo um, myocardiogram. Myo no, not myocardiogram, just myogram, yeah, myography. Myo is the Latin for muscle, so EMG is the electri it's electrical activity of the muscle. Um, and ordinarily as a signal, it's just a big noisy signal and you're looking for when it turns on and when it turns off. Um, and the relationship between the two of them, uh, granted, the, the, the heart is a muscle, so that's your, it's really kind of EMG that's specific to the heart. But your muscles that are in your bicep are different muscles. They're striated muscles as opposed to your cardiac muscles. They're, they're different, so you observe different patterns from them. Um, was there anything else about how you wanted to relate them? Just what the... Sort of. It's kind of a specialised version, but you wouldn't ordinarily consider the two together. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the, the heart rate variability is a, is a measure of variance of the heart rate itself. So once you've, uh, the distance between, difference between the peaks is the heart rate, and then the heart rate variability is the variance around that. Um, yes, so uh, for instance, the QT peak, the, how much that varies is a sign of, um, of instability, um, as is, uh, I forget the guy's name, but it's a triad method. So it's, you look for the triangulation of the, of the, the T peak, you look at the repolarization effects, which you have to look at another signal. And then, of course, um, it's the instability of how that moves. Um, so, yes, kind of the, the variability of each of those peaks has uh, inferences 
for um, physiology, of which the P wave will be instability within your atria. The, the T peak afterwards is instability in repolarization, um, which could be either a drug interaction or it could be something um, inbuilt and endogenous. Um, and the QRS complex as well, if that starts varying, that's very serious because um, that really should be very simple and straight. If it widens as well, it's a sign that you've got... Oh dear, I've got a doctor in the room, so I can't remember. Uh, could be failure, cardiac failure. Oh, fine. <laughs> I'm not going to say because it's probably I'm probably liable to that diagnosis. So, yeah. <laughs> Chapman. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so right. So in the ways that I've done it, you take you. I guess that's why I've never tried it because I've always I've always gone um, with finding the features of like the peaks and stuff and calling them my features and then applying my machine learning on the the, the distribution of heart rates, heart rate variability, QT, QT variability, things of this nature. Um, in the time series, I'm not entirely sure. So I guess if you were looking at things like arrhythmias and you were finding a way for a machine learning classifier to pick out arrhythmias, that worked quite well because the signal to noise ratio should be quite high in ordinary people. Um, most normal um, uh, people will have premature ventricular contractions. So I'm pretty sure if you ran, um, gosh, I can't think of a method to choose that would be, um, so that when I've used SVMs before, they've been fairly useful at doing this kind of work. So if you run um, SVM classifiers over, you take each ECG as a sample of your training set and use that thing, um, uh, classify that into categories, you can then pick up arrhythmias once you get to a certain end number, which is quite nice. Um, I should probably do a talk on that. Um, but yes, I find SVMs work quite well in that, in that regard. As in, like, correlating an ECG with, it, with another ECG signal? Yeah. yeah, so I guess because there's so much sort of little variability, so autocorrelating a signal is a, is a, is a classic signal processing thing to do. Um, arguably, that's where wavelets are more sensitive at doing this. So con convolving a wavelet, I tend to find, has been much more successful. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to autocorrelate a signal with itself, you can, it's basically a way of doing gain, which is quite nice. But correlating two signals together, I find it's quite useful if you want to do alignment between two signals. So if you want to align them on the beats, um, problem there, of course, is those bits vary. So it, it's generally, it's a way you, it's something you could do. I've never found it useful. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess this is, this is an unfortunate case where I'm certainly interested in the area. I have not found in, when I've been working in pharmaceuticals, the demand for that. Um, in fact, in one job, I was working for a biotech, started to write software for them, and the main investor said, do you want to come work in the software company instead? And I said, OK, then, and did something completely different. Um, computing in cardiology, arguably, is doing this kind of stuff. So trying to take a more data-driven approach to um, analysis of physiological signals. Yes, there's a lot of domain expertise in the judgment, but that's true of any machine learning. So the thing you get out of the end of it, um, inferring whether that's real or true or whatever, uh, comes with the burden of knowledge of that domain. Um, and hopefully, I mean, the, the, the low-hanging fruit that's kind of already, we're already getting is applying these machine learning things to, for instance, to do image analysis to find um, tumours. Like, you can get the machine to say, I think this is a tumour. Doctor can come along and draw their eyes and go, oh, yeah, that is a tumour. And it's this kind of thing. It's sort of judgment-assisted uh, kind of computer learning. Um, as for where there is a place for doing this, it can be, A, really hard to find it. 
B, uh, for how you describe as well, it's like the, 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 there's a lot of proprietary knowledge around medical devices anyway. So finding exactly how the method is used, there's n I, there isn't a lot of sort of open hardware at that level. It's open hardware at the lower end, but you need quite a lot of data. Clinical validation becomes a big point as to whether you can actually use it and actually sell it under such. Um, so there generally are lots of different groups, depends on which bit of physiology, because that's the other thing as well. I've done lots of stuff with cardiovascular stuff, but I don't know too much about, I don't know, endocrine pharmacology or neuropharmacology, things like that. There's lots of super specialties. Um, but um, yeah, cardiology is one of the ones that's more amenable to data analysis. There's a lot of people in there, uh, arguably, uh, generally for any of the kind of electrophysiology, generally has a lot of data-driven approaches. So EEG, EMG, all the, all the EEGs and ECGs and the rest of it, they tend to have groups that are built around those, of which I can point you to any one of those given ones, but there's lots of them. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Thank you.